Deception is uh, going to be the title of this message. And uh, first, I want to thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to be up here again and uh, bring the message this morning. And I want to start out by saying um, today and uh, every day of our lives that we live here on this earth, we're going to be living in days of deception because the devil and his cohorts are very, very busy. And uh, we are living in a time where we as Christians, especially those that get in this pulpit, we have to challenge Satan right here in this pulpit, not just at the shield of faith, but at every body of Christ in every building that preaches the word of God has to challenge Satan right here in that pulpit. And Satan's his most powerful weapon, and we know this, is deception. Because he came here to kill, steal, and destroy. And the only way he can do that is deceive us, you know, and get us on his side. Now, he's so deceptive at times, Satan will use the pulpit. He will use the pulpit to, you know, to smooth talk and uh, win people over especially unbelieving folks, to uh, doctrines of demons. You've ever heard that before? Yeah, I said it. Doctrines of demons. There is such a thing, and the Bible speaks of that. And that's a lot of things that are being taught in a whole lot of churches today, the doctrines of demons. A lot of folks not preaching this word. They're preaching doctrines of demons, and people are listening to it. Now, the Spirit expressly tells us that in the latter times, a lot of folks will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And that can be found in 1 Timothy 4.1. So I'm not just standing up here blowing smoke. I'm not telling you something that I just thought of off the top of my head. I'm telling you what's in the Word. We get the truth here at the Shield of Faith. Our pastor speaks the truth. You know, the Bible tells us to uh, test the spirits. So if I say something up here today that you disagree with, I'm a spirit. Test it. Go to the Word and read it for yourself. Right. You know, pastor teaches, Rick, Michelle, Chuck, anybody that gets up here and they say something that I'm just not clear on, I test the spirit. Ain't no harm in that. You know, but every time I've tested it, I haven't gone wrong because the truth is here at the Shield of Faith. That's what we get here. So, what is a doctrine? Well, basically, a doctrine is a, is a teaching or a way of giving instruction. And in a certain cases, it wholly conforms to the teacher's accumulated knowledge. So, this is the doctrine of God, this word right here. But it conforms to the knowledge that I have accumulated. So whatever that knowledge is that I have accumulated, whether it's correct or whether it's biblical, that's your job to ascertain it. If I'm sitting out there, pastors up here teaching, it's my job to ascertain it or uh, discern is another word in uh, what the situation is or what he's talking about. So in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Why? Why will people depart from the faith in latter times? Well, because when it comes down to this word right here, this Bible, there are two basic doctrines that's available to all humanity. Number one, this is God's doctrine or God's precepts. And number two, it's man's interpretation of God's doctrine and God's precepts. And that's available to everybody in the world that gets into the word knows anything about God. 
and all throughout history, this is proven fact. In many cases, man has made it very, very clear that he's wiser than God. And it may sound crazy, but it's true. Man thinks he's wiser than God. They don't want God in the schools. They don't want God in the government. And they're trying to take God out of the church because man thinks he's wiser than God. Now, whenever this occurs, which I call insanity, that's what it is. It's insanity to think that you're wiser than God, the creator of the whole universe. You know, you've got to be out of your mind. But anyway, you know, man, a change God's doctrine to fit his own ideas. And I've seen that in a lot of religions, and I know you have too. I'm not going to mention any, but there's a lot of religions out there that has taken this Bible right here and conformed it to their own ideas. They take the word and twist it to make a religion out of it. And then they go a step further. They'll instruct other folks with that same doctrine that they have invented. And of course, we know that man's truth, when it's derived from demons, it's always going to be contradictory to the truth of God. They're never going to agree. But see, man's truth ain't true. This is the truth. This is absolute truth. This is the only absolute truth on the face of the earth. In this book right here. Now, now get this. The men who intrude into God's spirit, this truth right here, with the express desire to change the word of God, they can only be following who? A demon. They can only be following, following Satan. Because since the beginning of time, Satan has disparaged God's word. Uh, in other words, he's tried to depreciate God's word. He's attempted to do that. And uh, he's attempted to usurp God's authority and, and to supplant God's truth with his own truth. Now man has, he's been attempted to to uh, replace God for over 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years. Whenever man came up on the earth into the Garden of Eden, he's been trying to replace God. He's attempted, that's what I said, attempting to replace God. And there can be no doubt that behind every variation of truth, there's a demon that's orchestrating and he choreographing every step that a man take, takes that's involved in this. You see, Satan is a master of disguise. The Bible tells us that. The Bible says that in 2 Corinthians, it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, that, and no wonder, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. As an angel of light. So what is the Lord saying? To me, that scripture is telling me that Satan capitalizes on our love of the light. He knows that we love the Lord, and the Lord is light. So he capitalizes on our love for the, for the Lord by coming as an angel of light. He wants us to think that he's good. He wants us to think that he's truthful. He wants us to think that he's loving. He wants us to think that he's all powerful. And he wants us to think that he's everything that God is. And the things that I just said, those are the things of God. And Satan wants us to think that he's just like God because he's always trying to imitate God. And people 
are not drawn to darkness. People are drawn to the light. That's, that's why Satan comes and appears as an angel of light because people are drawn to the light and he's trying to draw people to himself and his lies. That's his whole plan. I've heard people say that uh, there's another Jesus <laughs> and another spirit. I've heard that. I'm sure you've heard it too. Watch TV sometimes. Watch some of those Christian ministries, well, some of those ministries on TV. And where do you think they get this stuff? They ain't getting it from the God of heaven. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe they could be getting it from the God of this world. Yeah. Satan is the God of this world right now. He's on bar time. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back to take what belongs to him. Now, the same people, these same people say that they are doing signs and wonders to glorify God. Some of the things that they teach, you have to ask yourself, did we see any of this stuff in the Old Testament as we read the Bible? Nope. Was Jesus teaching or doing any of this stuff? Nope. Did the apostles experience or teach any uh, this kind of stuff when we were reading the Bible? Nope. None of this. So if we are looking at these things that I just talked about, where do we find them in the Bible? Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10 says, That which hath been is that which shall be, and that which hath been done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. So, ain't no another Jesus. Ain't no another spirit. The Bible makes it clear. And I believe the Bible. In verse 10 it says, Is there a thing whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It had been done long ago. In the ages which were before us. In other words, that scripture is saying to me that there is nothing new that's of the Lord. The Lord said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So there ain't nothing new. If he's the same, there's nothing new of the Lord. And if we can't find it in the teachings and the examples that we find here in scripture, it ain't new, and it ain't true. Because one thing that I know, and Pastor tells us this all the time, we have to be very, very careful of what and who we listen to. Very careful. I heard people say, oh, the Lord's doing a new thing. <laughs> but we know that the God we serve don't change. He ain't doing no new thing. As a matter of fact, it says in Malachi 3, 6, that for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Wow. Wow. If the Lord changed, guess what? We would be consumed by the devil. Thank God that the Lord don't change. We're going to go to the Garden of Eden right quick. Now, from the beginning of creation, we know that Satan has been an enemy of our souls because we read that in the Bible. And uh, he's used deception to change the truth about our God into a lie. That's his job. 
I'm not giving him credit, but he does it very well. Now, you ever had that burning passion for somebody that you really cared about? You got that burning passion for Michelle, don't you, boy? Click at it. <laughs> you know, that's what Satan has. He has a burning passion, but it's all about deception and destruction. He has a passion for that. He wants to deceive us. He can't get to God, so he tried to get at God's children. And we God's children. And he has a burning passion to destroy us. He wanna take us out of here. And the tactics that he uses are very deadly and they carry a, uh, eternal sting for ruin. I was uh, looking at Dr. Stanley this morning, getting ready for church, and uh, there was an email that was sent to him from someone and they were saying that they were resentful because of the sin that Adam and Eve committed and now they're paying for it. They are resentful, you know. And I said like, well, Dr. Stanley was saying that when Adam and Eve was in the Garden of Eden, God plainly told them, this whole garden, this is yours. Everything in this garden belongs to you. Do as you will, except for that one tree. I take that for myself. He told them, don't touch that one tree. Do not eat of that fruit. But they did. And when they did, it affected it like a domino effect. Everybody that was born after that, sin came into the world when they did that. So everybody is going to be have a sin nature. You're born with it. But this young fellow was resentful. But he just don't understand. And I said, well, Lord, maybe he's in deception. He's been deceived. He got to read the word to understand. He's got to listen to pastors on TV that are preaching the true word of God. He's got to go to a Bible-based church and get that word in him. And, and uh, then he'll understand that he shouldn't be resenting God. God created him for a purpose. But you sin is, is something that you were born with. But you can nullify sin in your life if you accept Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross. 1 John 1, 9, if you do something wrong, 1 John 1, 9. So that just caught me, and I said, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's in, in deception, and that's happening to a whole lot of folks, a whole lot of people resenting the Lord for no reason at all. They don't even know why. I can tell you why, because they've been deceived by Satan. And we as a church, we got to understand how Satan deceives believers through false doctrine. We have to understand that. We got to understand how he deceives believers through half truths. We got to understand how he deceives believers through counterfeit spiritual experiences. There's a lot of counterfeit, the Bible tells us that. And we see it. We see it. Now, I'm talking about people, when I say believers, I'm talking about people that done tasted how good Christ is. You done tasted it. You know it, how good he is. I'm talking about people who've been serving the Lord for 10, 20, for 30 years, and they are deceived. Ain't nobody sitting in this congregation right now that can't be deceived. Right. Satan can deceive anybody in here if you fall for his scheme. But if you know this word, it's hard for him to get at you. He'll go bother somebody else because he like it easy anyway. 
He don't want it hard. He want it easy. He can deceive any of us. So one thing that we can't do is walk around uh, with a big head and think we can't be deceived, because you can be deceived. He deceived Judas. Judas was walking with Christ every day. Yeah. Face to face with him. Breaking bread with him. But Satan got in him and, dece and he deceived Jesus. And he deceived, uh, Satan deceived Judas. So he can deceive us. All God's desire is that all people repent and be saved. But Satan's desire is that people be deceived and come live with him. But at the same time, who is Satan? He's the father of all lies. He's the father of deception. And the very people that need to accept the truth are being deceived. This book right here, you've heard me say this before, it's not about the truth. This book is the truth. It is the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, the God of this age, that Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So what is it that they can't see? They can't see the gospel in a nutshell. They can't see that Jesus Christ died on the cross. They can't see that Jesus Christ was buried. They can't see that he rose on the third day. They can't see that he is sending into heaven. They can't see that he is seated at the right hand side of the Father as an advocate for us down here on the, on the face of this earth. They can't see that, but we can see it. What did Charles say a few minutes ago? I choose. I choose to serve him. It ain't no accident that I serve the Lord. It ain't no accident that y'all serve the Lord. You choose to serve the Lord. Everything in this world is just about a choice. We have to make choices every day. Some wrong, some are right. But we choose to do the right thing. We choose to serve the Lord. Spiritually speaking, deception is deeper than just being tricked or lied to. In order to be saved, we don't need any particular level of intelligence in order to be saved. We don't need a whole lot of wisdom in order to be saved. In fact, the wisdom that we have sometimes, we use it to develop more sophisticated ways to sin. All we need is an open heart and to get into this word and allow Christ to do what he's supposed to do in us and we can be saved. I think the key to understanding uh, spiritual deception is the fact that God won't interfere with man's free will. And a lot of times, that means that we'll choose what we want to believe rather than what we should believe. Just because God won't interfere with our free will. And we'll do it right in the face of the evidence. But where's the evidence? Somebody might say, here it is right here. This book, this is the evidence. Right in the face of the evidence. We know that this is true, but we are still do wrong right in the face of the evidence. Anybody been there? What I mean is that the truth can be staring us right in the face. This right here, and we still don't believe it. There's people out there that don't believe this, and it's staring them right in the face. In Luke 16, 31, it says this, if they, don't, if they do not hear 
and listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded and convinced to believe, even if someone should rise from the dead. Even if someone should rise from the dead. Let's take that a little bit further. Even after Jesus had done all those miraculous signs that he did, in the presence of his disciples, they still didn't believe it. He did it in their presence, not when they were looking the other way, not when they had the hands covering up their eyes, not when they had their back turned to him, but they were looking at him right there in his face, and he did all those miracles and wonders and signs, and they still didn't believe him. And we got some folks right today still don't believe. This word is true. This word is true. It says that in John 12, 37, that that's willful unbelief. So, if I read this word is staring me in the face and I don't believe it, I got a will. That's willful disbelief or unbelief. I'm doing that on my own. Ain't nobody twisting my arm and telling me not to believe this. I'm doing it on my own because God gave me the ability to choose. I choose to believe it or choose not to believe it. Now that don't make me a big man because I choose not to believe it. It makes me a fool. Now, Eve is the earliest and the clearest example that I can give on how spiritual deception really works. Now, when they was in the garden and uh, the serpent approached them, and he asked Eve, he said, now, did God really say? And Eve responded to him by quoting every word that God said. Every word. Now, at that very point right there, she knew what to do, and she knew what not to do. She knew, because God done told her. So then the, the serpent he twisted it a little bit. He uh, tempted her and told her what she could gain by eating of that forbidden fruit. Same thing today. It ain't changed. God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So is Satan. He's the same. He don't change. He got one agenda. That's to take down God's children. That's his main agenda. So, then the things that are happening today, it was like he, when he tempted her, she saw something that she could gain by eating it from the, the forbidden fruit. It's just like he was telling her, if you steal that money over there, guess what? You can get yourself a new shoe. And she fell for it, hook, line, sinker. Same thing today. If you rob the bank or steal from your brother, you can buy that new suit you want. And we fall for it. Same thing. Bottom line is, Eve was lied to. So are we. Those same lies. It's like a vicious circle. They keep going on and on and on. But the bottom line is she ultimately chose to disobey God. We do the same thing. We disobey the Lord. Even though she could quote everything that the Lord said, she still chose to disobey. And when she was confronted, confronted with her sin, just like us, what did she say? 
She put the blame on somebody else. The serpent deceived me, Lord, and I ate. So, in other words, Eve was seduced by that serpent because she knew full well what God had said, but she chose to disobey God because she wanted something that that serpent had cleverly disguised, and she wanted that. That same dynamic is at work today. It ain't changed. Every time we reject God, we do so because in some way we really don't want to obey him in the first place. Every time we reject him, we don't want to obey. Man wants to rule himself. That goes back to man thinks he knows more than God. Stupidity. In other words, we are tempted by our own evil desires, our own evil desires. And it says that in James 1, 14. Now, that's not to say that every unbeliever is blatantly and spitefully turning from what he knows is true, but the unbeliever's desires for self-satisfaction makes Satan's deception all the more powerful. So when we give in to Satan because of our own evil desires, that makes him more powerful over us because the power has shifted. We got all the power. Satan don't got no power. We got all the power. God gave us all the power. Just like Adam did in the garden, he relinquishes his authority. And the devil took over. Anytime we resist God, we risk falling into spiritual deception. You give up the truth, and you believe just about anything. Hold it. Let me rephrase that. You give up the truth, you believe any lie. If you give up the truth. See, because Eve didn't see it because she was outmatched. No. She didn't, uh, 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 didn't see it because she thought she was doing right. She was lied to. She was lied to back then, just as we're being lied to today. We have to stop listening to the lie and start paying attention to the truth. We got to get the truth inside of us. We got to renew our minds with this word right here. That's the only way we're going to be able to resist. We got to get the mind of Christ. It's available. We got to get it in us. We got to get it in us. Because all human sin is based on human choice. It's based on human choice. When we reject the truth, we make ourselves vulnerable to a lie. And then repeated rejection of spiritual truth brings on spiritual deception. Simple, Pastor say, not complicated. <laughs> you might ask, why does God allow spiritual deception? Well, Got an answer for you. Maybe God allows spiritual deception as a form of punishment for willful sin. A punishment for willful sin because we sin on our own. You might ask, so why does Satan try to deceive us in the first place? Because he wants us to believe something that's simply not true. And believers, not unbelievers, but believers who are ignorant to this word right here, are more likely to be deceived. He don't need to deceive an unbeliever. I already got him. You know? And if we begin to accept those lies as the truth, then the devil's going to build a stronghold right here, right up here. So what is a stronghold? It's an incorrect thinking pattern that's based on error and lies.
that we have received as the truth. Example, a lot of times, and this has happened to me, we as believers feel guilt, guilty and condemned about something that happened in our past. We feel all dirty, we feel all unworthy, we feel like we can't approach our Heavenly Father. We feel like we just can't have a relationship with him. Because the devil has set up a stronghold right here. Because we listened to him. And he set up a stronghold, reminding us how bad we done messed up. Pastor tells us this all the time. You remember what you did back there in 1904? Wow. You know? <laughs> and and uh, you, you remember what you did last night? God ain't forgive you for that. You know, so what happened? He deceived us into believing that our sins are greater than the blood of Jesus. That's how uh, a satanic demon paints a picture in a person's mind. Now, if God has chosen to make us a new creation, then our past should no longer be associated with us. And God has chosen to make us new creations. We are new creations. So our past shouldn't be associated with us at all. We shouldn't even be thinking about the past. Because all that has been taken care of at the cross. Now what is greater? Our past sin or the blood of the lamb? Which was, thank you. It's the blood of Jesus. Remember that song Rachel always sing? Nothing but the blood. Ain't nothing greater than the blood of Jesus. I can take a shower with the best soap on the market. That soap can't clean me up like the blood of Jesus. Amen. I can listen to the best sermon on the face of the earth. But that sermon can't clean me up like the blood of Jesus. You can sacrifice all the goats, all the lambs, all the doves, whatever you, a horse, a mule, whatever you want to sacrifice. But that blood can't clean me up like the blood of Jesus. Can't nothing clean me up like the blood of Jesus. Ain't nothing like the blood of Jesus. And I thank God for the blood of Jesus. That's what Jesus meant in his dying words when he said, it is finished. It's done. He was saying, never again would the blood of bulls or goats or lambs or anything like that free a man from his sin. It is finished. I did it. I gave my life for it. It is finished. It's over. It's done. And all we got to do is stand on that and receive it. And only by accepting Jesus' blood shed on that cross for the remission of sins can we stand before God covered in the righteousness of Christ. Let the church say amen. amen. Yes. But the devil has convinced so many of God's children to believe in a lie that is making them feel just downright defeated and hopeless. That's not the way that a child of the almighty God should feel. You ain't supposed to feel downcast. You're supposed to be uplifted, full of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, because I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. We need to stand up and be the children of God that he meant for us to be. We need to stop letting the devil take control of our lives. We need to stop believing the lies of the devil. We need to put our foot on the devil's head and walk like a man and woman of God. Amen? Amen. Another way the devil tries to receive us is by is to see God incorrectly. You, you see, uh, Satan wants God's people to see their heavenly father as a dictator or somebody that's cold, or somebody that's distant, somebody that just don't really care about you, somebody that's building you up just to tear you down. God ain't like that. 
because one thing Satan knows, if he can put that in your mind and build that stronghold up here, he knows that that'll keep you from getting closer to God. And he don't want that. He wants you to get closer to him. But that ain't happening. Because we ain't going to allow it to happen. A lot of people fear God so much that they can't even get near, near God. But God's word is clear when it comes to fear. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Let me read that again. There is no fear in love. Who's love? God is love. So, there is no fear in God. But perfect love casteth out fear. Perfect love cast out fear. Okay, so perfect a perfect God cast out fear. If God is love, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. He that feareth is not made perfect in God. So if love casts out fear, and God is perfect love, why do we got to be afraid of it? We don't have to be afraid of it. Now, the Bible does tell us to fear the Lord, but that's a different type of fear. That's a, a respectful attitude. That's a, a reverence for the Lord. Now, a person who properly fears the Lord, he's not going to go outside there and mock the Lord's name and use the Lord's name in vain. But they won't be afraid of him either because he's loved. God's word tells us to watch out because the devil would love to get our minds so muddy up concerning our relationship with God through deception. So how do we encounter this weapon of deception? First, we have to know what deception is is based on. It's based on error. We need to know that. It's based on lies. We need to know that. It's based on untrue assumptions. So how do you counter a lie with the truth? See, it's one thing I found out about a lie. You have to disguise a lie. You don't have to disguise the truth. You will forget a lie it's impossible to forget the truth. You can't forget the truth. The, say, the devil says God doesn't love you anymore. Let's say since you committed adultery. But God's word says that we are loved for who we are, not for what we've done. And guess what? Before you accepted Jesus, before any of us accepted Jesus, Christ gave his life for us. So all we have to do is just turn back to our Heavenly Father, repent of our sins, and our relationship with him is going to be restored. I can hear the devil saying, yeah, well, God may forgive you, but your relationship with, with him will never be the same. That's what he's saying right now. I can also hear God saying, God will not only forgive us, but he deeply desires to be gracious to us. Our Heavenly Father wants to restore the precious relationship that we once had with him. Our Heavenly Father go in full circle. He walked with man in the garden in the beginning, and he's going to walk with man again when the, at the end of this age. And I say we need to stop meditating on the deception the devil has been feeding us from the beginning and start meditating on God's word. We need to stop being a pawn that Satan 
utilizes at his own will. We need to begin to test the spirits, whether it's on TV ministries or anything else. I say we stand up like true men and women of the living God. I say that we stay in the word so we will know how to deal with Satan and his tactics. The only way you're going to find out is get in this word. That's the only way you're going to find out. That way, we'll begin to tear down those strongholds that he's built right up here in our mind, and we'll be renewed by this word right here. And guess what? Our feelings is going to reflect those changes. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you right now for this word that was brought today. We pray, Father, that this word will get deep down into our spirits and that we will carry something out of here today, Father, that we can lean on and rest assured that you truly, truly love us. And God, we just lift you up right now because you are worthy. And in your eyes, we are worthy. What is man that you are mindful of him? God, we was built, made in your image. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for all the good things that you do for us. Because everything good that goes on in our lives comes from above. And right now we just give you praise, honor, and glory for who you are. Not for what you do, but for who you are. Because you are God. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he shed his blood on that cross for our sin. And right now we just give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, our Lord, our Savior, our God.